Okay, some of this stuff you know he's just leaving around to get under your skin. This is obviously another ploy in his relentless siege of one-upmanship to get your goat. The very same goat that you've been meaning to bleat like ironically. Goat? But that will still have to wait for a more appropriate time. You think he knows that deep down you feel like you're still not ironic enough to get stuff like this. And this is probably some weird gauntlet he's throwing down to see if you'll get it. But honestly, you think this material is just a little too ironic. You just don't need to see this shit right now. Heading into the kitchen, there seems to be no sign of bro in here either. Well, aside from the absurd quantity of awesome, dangerous stuff he leaves lying around. With an escalating sense of threat, you think it's time to shift, nine, your katana, nine, to your specibus. You figure it's better to free up the card anyway, since you might need to grab some of this stuff. Dave, set that blender to mix. You... guess bro stuck some fake blood capsules in that puppet? Pretty gross. You spot one of your bro's many webcams nearby, recording the incident. It seems you may have just been an unwitting accessory to some sort of grisly puppet snuff film. You're not totally sure how you feel about that. Was that a puppet? Dave, try to capture lock that buster sword from behind the microwave. This might be the only thing in your whole apartment that's a bigger piece of shit than your own sword. You put it back behind the microwave where it belongs. Dave, set that blender to crush ice. It's just sort of bouncing around in there. You're making a bit of a mess now. Dave, hide the evidence in the microwave. See, like, his hobbies are cool and all. And you guess he's got to put his shit somewhere. But what if he wanted to heat up a burrito or something? This kitchen is pretty much useless. You capture log all the fireworks. Five. The sink has to offer. You know these things are going to come in handy. What would they be in the sink if they weren't? Looks like one of them is still stuck inside the garbage disposal. You grab the shurikens. Five. And... Hey! Hey! Careful where you're putting that stuff, especially if you're looking to turn your Silidex into a powder keg full of sharp things. You put the box of fireworks, three, back into card five and prepare to start o- Or card three, apparently. That settles that. You take the nunchaku, three, once again, grabbing without thinking ahead. First, you capture log the box, five, again, Do dodge. while adeptly avoiding the shuriken trap which you yourself set up only moments ago. You again round right up Right in the eye fireworks. like butters. Time to regroup here. You grab each shuriken, three, one at a time, knocking out those nunchaku. But no worries, you've got a plan. You take the nunchucks, six. Everything seems to be in order now. It would have been badass to go with the authentic Japanese names for each weapon, but sometimes you've just got to compromise with this modus. You flip over your fetch modus and check out the bag. You're not really sure where it is you're keeping this thing. Oh well, who cares? Oh hell no! Not after all that trouble you went through to get that stuff situated. This is potentially a very dangerous button. First, you program your modus with a Scrabble Points hash function, adding it to the list. This might be a cool function to use, but it looks like you'll have to empty your Silidex to select it. You're just not gonna do that yet. No way. Dave, check the box, detect collisions. Okay. And just what is this guy so happy about? What's he looking at up there? You think if you see one more soft, bulbous bottom being like, kind of jutting out an impudent or whatever, you are going to fly off the handle. You take the skateboard six, actually, no, no you don't, a collision has been detected, you, um, you take the, uh, wheel, uh, ride, seven. Man, your inventory's nomenclature is getting lamer by the minute. Dave, capture log the unplugged power cord. You take the power cord, five, wait, no, not going to work. You take the battery pack, eight, damn it. You take the battery pack, nine, 
using the Y as a consonant. Your Silodex reluctantly accepts. It's a tactic notoriously employed by hash map noobs, but you just don't care about that now. Besides, it's not like your bro is around to see. How much you want to bet his bro's actually controlling the thing through a laptop or something? Oh, it was just little Cal again. You can never stay mad at him. Anyway, you've got to get this way rude hunger under control. You figure you ought to scope out and the And I'm hungry grub. now. Thanks, mate. This hunger is so ill-mannered, it would make a room full of snooty dowagers to commit mass suicide. Oh, God. More shitty swords. Of course you knew these were in here. Okay, let's see what he's got. He's got uh, Aragorn's sword from Lord of the Rings. Uh, no, that's not from DMC. He has a gun sword. That's another Final Fantasy. More so Jesus, what the fuck doesn't he have? We can save some time. You're not even sure why you looked. If you want to keep any food or beverages in this apartment, you've pretty much got no choice but to hide stuff away in your closet. Zabuza's blade. The hell huh. with it. You tried to take the entire jumble of unbelievably shitty sores and brace yourself for... Looks like that works, actually. Two. You capture log the jumble of unbelievably shitty swords. Dave, use the ice maker. It's still hot around here. You dispense several cherry bombs. Wait. Who's that looking at you in the reflection? Where'd the little dude scamper off to this time? You go for the cherry bombs, nine, unsuccessfully. After mulling it over a bit, you take the red spherical salutes, one. Blender, two, is a pretty simple word, and you can already tell that's not going to work. Instead, you take the Whirling Blade Pitcher, four. That's really a much better name for it anyway, you think. You're still not sure what he's so happy about, or what he's looking at up there. While you're at it, you dump the contents of the blender, oops, I mean, the whirling blade pitcher, into the disposal. But you suffer an unfortunate garbage disposal head jam. You notice something in the reflection. Something above you. It's the hatch to the crawl space above your apartment. Bro's always tucking away in there when he's busting out his rad stealth stunts. He's so slick that dangling cord never even jostles. You just know he's being ironic with these weird mind games. There's no way anyone would be serious about aping those shitty movies. Dave, it is suggested that you use the turntables and cinder blocks to make a fort. It's a pretty sweet fort you just made, and I'm pretty sure your brother would agree. Under different circumstances, you might be high-fiving over it right now. But rather than get inside and take it for a spin, you really just need to use it to get up to that hatch. It is time to face your destiny. No going back now. That explains that. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, there was pretty much no way there wasn't going to be a bunch of puppets in there. Fuck. Ah. <laughs> uh, part 13, face bomb combo times 2. You don't say. Your brother might just be a serious psycho. Your brother may be a future serial killer because he seems to have already killed small animals, which is a huge red flag. And instead of feeling bad and all that sort of shit, he tried to dump the body somewhere. And then he put a frog in a blender, which you just murdered yourself. And that is not ironic. That is very worrying. We've heard this conversation already. Moving on. Dave, read the note on that hatch. Bro. Roof. Now. Bring Cal. We're dying, man. We're making this happen. This is from, um... This is from Team America.
Dave, be the other guy. You are now the other guy. John, take the dowels and sheets from bed and make a tent. Oh, this is so much fun. A huge waste of time, yes. But so much fun. I don't get it. What are you doing? You put the punch card containing the pogo ride into the slot and carve a totem from one of the Crookside dowels. You repeat the process using the card containing the code for the hammer, as well as the one with the random code you punched over the shaving cream card for the hell of it. You carve the respective totems for the cards. You do the same thing with the capture log capture log card. A uh, pretty bare bones looking totem. If you ask you. You stow the totems in your Athenium. The Alchemeter requires one unit of any type of grist to produce one card. You decide to use Shale, since it seems less generally useful than the Build Grist as of now. It might be more you valuable You make a whole later. bunch of them. Whoa, did you make all these? Yes. Sweet, thanks! What'd you do with all those blue wobbly vase things? I brought the totems out to the alchemeter to test them. I'm taking some things into my own hands to save some time. Okay. You create a hammer at the expense of two units of build grist. You make a pogo ride too. Minus five build, one shale. You use the totem carved with the random code. You create a... <laughs> A rocket pack with some random crap stuck inside of it. Looks like a uh, a cinder block, a violin, and a flower pot. The items have rendered the device completely inoperable. <laughs> yeah, you figure you might as well put this piece of junk to use. Using a little strategy, first you grab Harry Anderson's Wise Guy by Mike Caveney, then the cards. Then your ejected PDA, then the book again to flush the cards into your deck. Nice going! John, turn on Detect Collisions. You flip your Fetch Modi, but find no such option. This is idiotic. I don't get it. An introduction. Who's this wise guy? Blood loss in the Big Easy. New Orleans, 1977. The close-up room at the Magic Castle was this mean little box that tended to fill up with so much smoke you'd swear someone was cremating a wet dog in there. In walks Anderson. There isn't much that gets liquor to pause its journey from the table to my lips, but I'll be the bastard love child of a listless Octoroon if that kid wasn't the cat that swallowed the canary in a dapper little hat. It looked like he was testing the tensile strength of his suspenders to the damn near limit with a pair of cocky thumbs. I wasn't impressed. But I was a fool. So in my motion for another beverage, he'd already slipped into polite conversation at a table held down by some notoriously brusque regulars. He had them in no time flat. They were melting butter in his glass ramekins. Whatever tatty yarn he'd spun to win them over, I didn't catch a word of it. One of them laughed. I was angry. Envious? Maybe a little. Yeah, you bet I was. Anderson and one of those little wooden finger choppers that Mickey Hades used to sell. The kind where the blade could be removed easily and clearly shown. It was a very convincing little guillotine that did not look like a novelty store toy. Harry would get a guy to examine the chopper and then cut a cigarette in half. Then he held the guy's hand up and told this silly story. The story, of course, was artifice. A distraction for the guy and the audience while he worked his stuff with the chopper. Or it would become that once his famous chopper trick was perfected, vaulting him to fame, fortune, and the crowning position in the television judiciary. With what became his signature of plum, Anderson was in moments of font of breast pocket gauze, profuse apology, and redoubling determination. It's really amazing how hard it is to find a bloody sausage-sized piece of a guy on the floor of a room that dark and smoky. Impossible, I think we all proved. Just as impossible as blind willy buttermilk Stubbs was going to find it to work his trumpet tomorrow night without his twiddling fingers. You never really understood what Caveney's relation to Anderson was, or why he wrote this book about him. His ambivalent attitude towards your favorite magician in these anecdotes always struck you as a little weird. And to be honest, you tend not to read much of the text in the book. 
you mostly like to look at the diagrams for all of the cool tricks. A hole in the ace, aka the a-hole trick. Here is a perfect example of how Harry could ruin several decks of cards, waste everyone's valuable time, and have you love him for it. He was good at that. One day he noisily emptied his suit jacket pocket into the hood of his car in search of change for the meter. A clunky metal thing slid from the pile and bounced on the sidewalk. As I retrieved it for him, I asked what he was doing with the hole puncher in his pocket. His face lit up with a question like he was an elf and I asked him how he felt about climbing into the hollow of a big tree to bake some cookies or something. The 2 foot 6 inch height differential between us causes these comparisons to enter my mind. A small crowd had already gathered around even before he produced the first pack of unmolested cards. How people seem to gather and how they even know a street performance is about to take place, I'll never know. It's perhaps Anderson's greatest trick, learning the marks like that. I wanted to ask if he was sure about this, performing in broad daylight. He was used to working in dark rooms. It's usually the first thing out of his mouth when he would queer a trick. I'm really more accustomed to working in a darker room than this. But Harry was excited, and he had already butchered the first deck of cards with the hole puncher, and issued the first round of apologies to the crowd. These were like the primer apologies, that's the sort that got the folks loosened up a bit before the seven-course meal of ingratiation that would inevitably follow. He asked me for a fresh deck of cards, and I gave him one. The principle behind the trick in theory, as he explained to me later, was to punch holes in what appeared to be one card, but was in fact two or more together. That's the difficulty he often had in squeezing the puncher with his little elfish hands. Then, using some coy maneuvers with his thumb, temporarily concealing the hole he slid the card beneath it with his palm, the hole would seem to disappear or move to another part of the card. Oh yeah, that's right! The old hole in the ace trick! Interestingly enough, pertaining to punching holes in cards and making them disappear and stuff. Your hands were never really strong enough to make this one work all that well either. But actually, that gives you an idea. You overlap two of the punched cards. They mask each other's hole patterns. You carve another totem using the new combined hole pattern. You take it to the alchemeter and... Oh man, looks like Rose made like a million hammers for some reason. Get all of this shit out of the way, you're about to make something sweet! You got the Pogo Hammer! What did you do? I combined the cards with the lay thingy to make this. It's so sweet, man, look at me go! I see. That was a really good idea, John. Nice work. Thanks, I got the idea from Harry Anderson. Who? Uh, you know the show Night Court? No. Oh, well, bottom line is he's awesome, and that's really all there is to say on the matter. You get a vicious rhythmic bouncing combo going and easily slay the imp in one blow. You and the pogo ride are catapulted sky high in the process. Sweet catch! Hey, uh, that was a pretty, uh, nice, uh... Sweet catch. Save. Oh yeah, this is pretty comfy. Why don't you just, like, carry the bed around with me in it? Up to the gate up there. I can't interact with you directly or anything that you are touching if it will result in moving you. See? Oh, lame. The game probably regards that as kind of cheating. So what if he just starts jumping up and down on the bed and while he's jumping you lift it a little bit at a time creating a new platform for him to keep jumping up from. That way you just essentially create a trampoline and you just keep moving him upwards. In a way, thieving you of your free will as an adventurer and the need to advance by your own skill and ingenuity. The server player is just a facilitator. Well, okay. All that scurrying around kind of wore me out. I think I'm going to rest here for a bit. Rose, can you keep the imps at bay, like, drop stuff on them, if they sneak too close? No. You should pick up your hammer and defend yourself. What? Come on! 
I have no idea what the hell Dave is up to, or if he's any closer to recovering the game. There's some stuff I'd like to try, in case he doesn't come through. Alright. I'm just gonna rest my eyes here for a second, though. Why doesn't she just remove the stairs so they can't climb up? Rose, check the alchemy excursus. Looks like a sort of index documenting all known results for punch card alchemy combinations. This could be a convenient resource as you start to stumble on more useful card combinations. But ever since John started punching cards, you've been contemplating other ways this item manufacturing system could be put to use. In particular, if you obtain the code for any item at your disposal, you think you could theoretically send the card to John and he could make it himself. That is, if you can think of anything that would be worth sending to him. You eject the disc and capture log the server CD. Rose, message John the capture code. Oh, god damn it! GG. What? Didn't the battery charge? God, it's his dad. A puppet's ass? Hey! Whoa, there you are. How's your adventure going, John? It's okay. I'm making some progress, and Rose finally connected again, so she is helping me out now. That's good. Oh, but like, I don't think I'm actually saving the world here. Uh, I don't know what I'm really accomplishing, but I guess it's not that. Hmm, well, I think whatever it is, it must be pretty important. Don't lose hope, John. I think it'll all turn out for the best if you stay positive. Just keep listening to your grandmother's advice. Yeah, you're probably right, but, uh, I don't think I mentioned Nana to you, did I? Oh, uh, I don't know, didn't you? Huh, I don't know. Maybe you talked to Rose or Dave about it or something. Yeah, maybe that was it! They're, all, they're really weird when they try to talk about you. Like, they're always trying to convince me you have some spooky powers, but I'm always like, no, she seems like a pretty regular girl to me. <laughs> but then, when I think back, maybe there are times it seems like you know some things. Like, maybe you know more about a thing than you're telling me. I don't know. Oh, well, John, I want to explain lots of things to you. Some things that I know. I'm just... waiting. Waiting for what? Oh, John, I forgot! I was messaging you about that meteor that fell near my house. Oh, yeah. Whatever happened to that? Oh, look, a distraction. Let's talk about this conversation never. Oh, boy. Well, it turns out I was confused about it. Really confused. See, I guess I fell asleep for a while and lost track of time. And that happens! Yeah, I know, tell me about it. Maybe you should, like, wear an alarm clock or something. So, what is the deal with the meteor? Well, it's hard to explain, but... I know what it is now! And I know everything's going to be okay! So, what is it? Or is it just another one of those, you're waiting to tell me stuff? Oh gosh, I really want to tell you all this stuff, but I can't yet. I really think you need to wake up first! Huh? Okay, well, not literally. Well, okay, maybe kinda literally. Oh, stop being so confusing! Well, well, anyway, time for you to go, John. I think you have some company. You stick the pogo hammer back in your strife specibus and get ready to kill some more of those pesky little... Huh? Boss uh, fight! What's that? <laughs> I like that. Rose, why are you dropping something on that thing? Oh no! John, be the imp. You be the imp and quickly abscond the fuck out of here. This is what weaker adversaries do whenever things get too hot to handle, which is frequently. 
You stop being the imp because that was stupid and scurry over to your magic chest that you suddenly remembered was on the roof. There are some things in there that would be good to stock up on for a major battle. But it looks like someone has plundered your chest. This is so outrageous. You are being ambushed! There isn't much room to maneuver on this sloping roof. Maybe you should consider making your way to higher ground. John, ascend to the highest point of the house. You go up here. You peek over the edge. It already seems like a long way down to your yard, not even to speak of whatever's below. Hey! Weren't your trick handcuffs dangling from that branch earlier? Damn it! Why do imps always got to be making off of all of your sweet gear? You are confronted with a pair of enormous foes! Pair? What the this fuck? This is it! You have no choice but to wage a fierce rooftop battle! This is totally gonna happen now, and could in no way conceivably be interrupted by a sudden shift in our attention. It's go time! It's time to do this thing! We're doing it, man! We're making this happen! Where'd the second one come from? And wouldn't it be better for you to go on lower ground because they don't have solid footing? Now that you're on the higher platform, they have solid footing, which is not what you want. It's the exact opposite of what you want! Alright, Act 2, Part 14. Let's do this. I assume you haven't played Dark Souls. No, I have not. Alright, here we go. Act 2, Part 14. Dave, stop being the other guy. You stop being the other guy. You're not even sure what that meant anyway. I expect him to know battle tactics. I expect him to be slow. Ah, oh, fuck, I'm now wet! Damn it! I've become one of those Twitch streamers. Give me a sec. God damn it. <laughs> Clearly, I, ha I am so tired that my brain is just like, water, drink, oh fuck. <laughs> Let us continue. is that? You are now the Wayward Vagabond. Retreat. Got him already. Wayward Vagabond, examine that rotten pumpkin. Oh, so he's got that whatever it's called thingy and it's running low on whatever that thingy is. So I'm guessing in his world, it's not infinite, it's really low. Which is why his world is a load of shit. Okay, but he's got a plant that's capable of growing. Gotcha. What pumpkin? Eh. Wayward Vagabond, check the little red bar. 
It appears to be a gauge for a large power cell, perhaps fueled by some type of nuclear reaction. If this is the case, it is running relatively low on fuel. But who knows how long it's been running here. You do not care about this sort of nonsense and you will disregard it at once. You are very hungry. Capture log that can of gravy. Capture log? You have no idea what that means. It is total nonsense and you do not know what to make of it. You will not give the foolish notion a second thought. So this is in the future. Pick up the can of gravy. Just pick it up. You just pick it up. You are now holding the can of gravy. Use your sharp teeth to poke a hole in the lid of the can. Your teeth are useless for this task. They are blunt like that of livestock, presumably suitable for mashing up plant matter and not puncturing metal. Attempt to open the can with your weak, pathetic digits. Your weak, pathetic digits are not strong enough to penetrate the can. Your fingers are certainly pointy enough, and your black carapace is suitably rigid. But you just don't have enough muscle for the task. It is suggested that you take the can labelled beans. Oh, okay, you take that too. Now how about you examine that can of custard? The can clearly reads mustard, a fact of which you were perfectly well aware. It's sort of cumbersome holding all of these cans at once. You doubt you can hold many more than this. Maybe one or two. You'll need to find something to put stuff in if you want to carry a lot of things around. Now how about you examine the marking on your wrist? You drop all the cans at once and look at your wrist. It is a sort of specialized barcode pattern. This brings back unpleasant memories and you would prefer not to dwell on it. Now examine the small potted plant. <laughs> what plant? Uh, then check the book on human <laughs> etiquette. It appears half of the pages of this book have been eaten. <laughs> The daunting volume is considerably lighter than it once was. You are somewhat skeptical about the nutritional value contained in these pages. However, of practical wisdom they contain, there can be little doubt. You have learned so much. It is suggested that you clear out all of the cans inside the purple machine. You empty the peculiar cabinet and take a quick inventory of your canned goods. You have beans, mustard, gravy, Bread, shrimp, asparagus, cheese, rice, corn, peas, flour, chestnuts, mayo, ham, potatoes, and squash. Such a bountiful plenty, and yet the delights taunt you from within their small metal prisons. Ugh, then perhaps you should search the room for a can opener. You have already looked all over the place for a can opener, even making a few electronic inquiries about one, to no avail. Nothing else inside the purple thing either. Then how about you locate a nearby sharp object? You wield your trusty knife! It is actually a, um... Uh, uh, well, uh, you're not sure what they're called. A shank? It's an old one of those rusted red mailbox arm-swingy flappy doodads. Either for letting you know there is mail inside the box, or maybe for alerting the mailman to outgoing mail to be collected. You don't know, really. You've wrapped a little piece of cloth around it for the grip. It, it is useless for opening cans. Then how about you be the imp? This means nothing to you. You are not an imp, and you have no idea what an imp is. And you will not entertain such frivolous and childish ideas ever again. You feel stupid and you hate yourself a little for even considering it. Then become the mayor of Cantown. As the glorious founder and mayor of Cantown, you erect a dignified, majestic city hall out of cans, fittingly capped off with a tome of good manners for the roof. You have given yourself a very official and important looking mayoral sash made out of old cables to complete your look of authority. A number of rather civic minded citizen cans gather in front of this building to offer adulation to their fair and magnanimous leader. All is well. You immerse yourself in this beautiful dream as you whittle away the minutes, or perhaps hours. You love the idea of being a mayor. You love everything about mayors and the concept of an orderly, civil democracy. It all seems so mannerly and reasonable to you. Everyone is friendly and happy and the city runs like clockwork. The foundation of the government is based on the mutual respect between the leader and its people. 
It is also built on having a really great mayor that everyone loves who is totally amazing, heroic, and brave. Mayors are so much better than kings. You hate kings, and you think kings are really stupid. They are petty, bossy tyrants, and they are really full of themselves and are basically awful in every way. God, do you hate kings. Explore the west of Cantown. Over here. So is he one of the chess pieces? In this case, he is not the knight, uh, not the rook. Is he a bishop? The one that goes diagonally? Because they usually wear that type of armor. So is he possibly the bishop of um, the black side of the, um, the um, chessboard? Maybe. I don't know. Is the other side of the room. There is another one of those purple storage boxes and some useless objects scattered on the floor. Uranium. Perhaps you can use the glowing green rock to open the can. <laughs> you pick up the nugget of uranium and... Holy shit! <laughs> Oh, that was so stupid. You've Why got cancer. You You've got cancer. Examine the box of crayons. It's chalk, numbnuts. Uh, inside the box, there are 12 pieces of chalk in every color of the... 10 pieces of chalk. In most colors of the rainbow. You are excited by this. How about you try to open the storage box? It's locked! There must be some sort of release mechanism for this thing. Check the contents of the yellow container. The container is full of motor oil. This does not seem useful to you right now. Don't drink Perhaps it. you should rescue that poor lightning bug. There is nothing you can do for this new little friend. Attempting to crush the amber encasing the firefly would likely cause it harm. It nevertheless bravely flashes on. You find its light Alluring. Inspiring. To you, it seems as if it could quite easily serve as the light of... Democracy. <laughs> Fuck. Use the chalk to draw some roads. Oh, you're kidding me! You sketch a handsome network of sprawling thoroughfares for your citizens to traverse. The adoring population applauds its mayor's keen instincts for city planning. You even add some lush vegetation to your city with a piece of blue chalk. Because you can't seem to find a more suitable colour for some reason. Lay down a chalk foundation for Cantown's civic growth. You develop westward, settling those fertile plains and claiming them for your city. Chessboard. You section off a number of residential and commercial zones for civic growth, arranging the only logical pattern that occurs to you. You colour the residential zones with your piece of white chalk, but for some reason, none of the other colours in the box strike you as suitable for the commercial zones. Perhaps there is an alternative. Use your own pee for the commercial zones! What?! You cannot urinate because you have not had anything to drink for quite some time. You are very thirsty. Also, that is a really terrible idea, and you would not consider befouling your wonderful city in that way for even a moment. How is this relevant? Then use the motor oil to designate the commercial zones. You fill each empty square with a bit of motor oil to complete the zoning. It looks rather striking to you. You can hardly imagine that an up-and-coming young can trying to make it in the world would not be delighted to live in your fair district. You are very careful not to get any of the unpleasant fluid on your person. I, I'm somehow tempted to play... I forget what that um, game is called. I think it's called Cities. It's on... Um, where is it? I think I bought it. Yeah, Skitty... Cities Skylines. I bought it years and years ago. I'm half tempted to play it because he's building a fucking city. I just call it Kumaville. Oh, God. Peel the label from the can of mayo and affix it to sash. Survey surroundings in search of more terrain for your city. It seems you have run out of territory for your western expansion. But there is still a lot of empty wall space. Perhaps your citizens will be happier with a colourful backdrop that would make them feel more at home. Using most of your imagination and an entire piece of sky blue chalk, you render a bright and cheerful sky full of clouds.
Well, this one here reminds me of the sky where whatever his name is trying to climb. The one on the left, I don't understand what that is, but it's black. Oh. You have decided that very closely orbiting your city is a luminous planet about which orbits a single moon. You switch to another shade of blue and continue rendering on the western wall. Orbiting much further from your city are four planets. None of these have any satellites, you have decided. Yes, that makes sense, you think. And on the southern wall, beyond an impenetrable veil of darkness, occupying the furthest orbit yet, there is an ominous planet. A moon circles this one too. Check out that rampaging boy on the screen. Oh yeah, it's that guy. You had almost forgotten about him and his confusing shenanigans. It seems like he has things well in hand at the moment. He does not appear to need your help, and you have already concluded that he cannot help you. At least for the time being. So you have four screens for four people. Try turning on the other three monitors. You have no idea how to turn these on. There is no mouse for this weird quadra monitored computer. It can only be operated through text commands from its keyboard. Perhaps there is a special key or command which will allow you to switch to another monitor. Try pressing tab. <laughs> Consume several cans. You free the heavenly brown elixir from the jewels of pink carapace and imbibe them like the wind. It is so sweet and sugary. You wonder how much sugar can fit into one can. Whatever mighty wizard concocted this potion is truly deserving of your fear and respect. A Coca-Cola company, oh shit. Welcome the rest into the city. The tabs are naturalized as loyal new citizens of Can Town. All cans are welcome and equal in your city, regardless of can content and whether empty or full. It is not like emptying a can kills it or anything. They're just cans after all. Now, try hitting escape. Feeling refreshed and heavily caffeinated, you go back to work on the big computer. You hit escape, which seems to minimize the action window thingy and reveals a history of all of the commands you have entered. It sounds like a Pokemon battle theme in the background. You use the arrow key to scroll up a bit. Elite Four style. You can't believe how much you've already typed into this stupid contraption. What a waste of time. You scroll all the way up to your first command. It looks like there are more commands above it. Maybe someone was entering commands on this thing before you. There aren't many more. At the top of this list appears to be the very first command. You activate screen 2. The signal is garbled and you have no idea what you're looking at. That's Some sort of filthy beggar pleading for help? Rosa's house. No one is around, and nothing is happening. But his hat's You seem broken. to be locked out of any sort of interaction with whatever's happening on this monitor. And arm. Oh! You switch to screen 3. It's another one of these rapscallions. This monitor is locked too. You can't tell him what to do. Not that you really want to. Okay, so who's 4? Since it just looks like more confusing nonsense to you. You consider switching to screen 4, but decide against it. WHY?! You have a feeling that whatever's there could just confuse you even more. And you don't even care all that much anyway. Wow! What a Type the block. home command. All four screens activate. Together they display a countdown starting at 4 hours and 13 minutes. Type the reboot command. You can't! Nothing is working anymore. The timer seems to have disabled the keyboard. Now be the mayor! Enough of this nonsense! You are an important mayor and this absurd contraption has wasted enough of your time. You've got a city to govern, with a carapace fist! Which is to say firm, yet polished, and supple as the situation demands. Anyway, this will help you kill some time while you wait for the clock to count down. Create employment opportunities for the cans! You temporarily dismantle City Hall to free up all of the camp power available to create a vigilant town militia and divide them into two groups, marking them with distinct teams and ranks using the piece of white chalk and the motor oil. 
You organize them in a phalanx across the countryside, preparing for a stiff training regimen. When you are through with them, your forces will be a well-oiled machine. Chalk another one up to bold leadership. He's getting a sugar high. You waste more than four hours on this tomfoolery. Mourn the loss of Citizen Tab. Your caffeinated jittering must have agitated all of the little bubbles curiously hidden in the liquid, creating too much pressure in the can. You speculate this is why it exploded as you'd nervously eye the timer. You're starting to wonder what will happen when it reaches zero. Maybe it would be best not to be near it when this happens. Probably not. Oh, wow. Alright. It is time for part 15. Is that the finale? I believe it is. The end of Act 2, part 15. I don't know how big this one is. Let me uh, take a look. View information. No. Information is useless. Uh, view statistics. Well, that's fucking useless. What about status? 13 minutes. All right. It's time for part 15. Let's do this. What are you even watching? Look, I'm trying to figure that out, but apparently it's relevant to some random shit. I'm starting to feel that I'm too sober for this. <laughs> At this point, we might as well be watching fucking End of Evangelion, to be honest. Because, <laughs> you know, at this point. All right. <laughs> Homestuck, Act 2, Part 15. <laughs> Let's see what the hell's going on. Is it gonna blow up? Minutes in the future, though perhaps not as few as implied by circumstance, a peregrine mendicant trundles precious cargo beneath the gleam of the celestially ominous. Is that us? Yeah, that is us, I think. No? No, that's a different person. Are those the guys that actually travel to the other planets? Maybe you should go outside and get some Wait, sun. Wait, that guy's white. We're black. You say a bittersweet goodbye to your beloved city. It is time to move on to greener pastures. By which, of course, you mean an arid, sandy wasteland upon which nothing green has grown in years. The door shuts behind you. A panel on the door becomes illuminated. As you ponder over the marks on the panel, you hear another mechanical sound overhead. What? The LCD panel appears to have a touchscreen interface. Curiously prod the funny looking spirograph. It appears the funny looking spirograph room is locked. The floor rotates a full 360 degrees beneath you, while the surrounding wall seems to stay put. Try selecting the triangly fractal. The triangly fractal room does not appear to be locked. The floor turns 120 degrees and the door opens. You go through the door to find another room. It's the same size as the other one you just wasted all of that time in, while the clock was ticking down to something which may or may not have been your doom. Maybe there is something in here that will help you escape. Against the wall, there is another perplexing contraption. Against the opposite wall is some sort of control panel which catches your eye. It has two large screens, but only one appears to be active. There are fields for numbers which appear to be modifiable with the dials to the right. So you've got 2019, I'm guessing April uh, the 13th at 12 hours 13 minutes. I guess we can look at this as altitude. Let's guess it's feet, and this will be coordinates. And this is looking like Earth. So this must be where you are. Some numbers are already supplied by default, perhaps entered by the previous user. There are a few buttons below, 
the largest one bearing the symbol marking this room. Also, it looks like there is a meter stick propped up there for some reason. Attach your trusty knife to the meter stick. You immediately craft a measuring spear through possibly the most advanced form of alchemy employed thus far. This is obviously the most important thing to do first. Obviously. Or it would obviously be the most important thing to do had you remembered to bring your trusty knife. You feel so insecure without your trusty knife. It makes you want to slit your wrists, or at the very least, flog your carapace with some sort of measuring apparatus. Don't do that. Look at the other wall. You examine the perplexing contraption okay, that's across the room. Stuff, right? You, of course, have no idea what it could possibly do. You adopt the only obvious course of action, which is to poke and prod at it with your handy ruler. You are quite sure this is what science is all about. I might teleport you. It is suggested that you press the triangle pattern. You go back to the control panel, which is probably, obviously, controls that gizmo, and you push the big blue button, which is obviously probably the most obvious thing to push. You appearify a pumpkin. Upon examination of the pumpkin, it seems that this mysterious gourd was transported, appearified, from a specific time and location somewhere on this planet that you are on. You wonder if the machine, a purifier, will take any object that exists at whatever time and location you supply. There is a symbol carved on the pumpkin. You don't know what it means, and you doubt it will ever prove to be relevant in any way. An arrow? You consider dining on the ripe flesh of the plump vegetable, but your curiosity about the purifier gets the better of you. You try to sneak a nibble from the pumpkin nonetheless. <laughs> You move on to examine the attractive green buttons. The icon for the one on the left is that house shape you've seen plenty of times before. The right one, on closer inspection, appears to be a map for this underground facility, with an X marking its center. You push the button. All of the numbers change. Perhaps these are the coordinates for the location of the center of this facility, along with the local date and time? If this is the case, it would make a useful reference point for your current bearings. One way to find out would be to attempt to purify something from this facility. It should be easy to zero in on a location relative to the center, because you have an uncanny knack for tracking precise distances you have already traversed in whatever units you choose. Your handy ruler gives you a good clue as to the basic unit of human measurement. You will go with that. You nudge the coordinates very slightly and bump up the elevation by 0.5 human measurement units. You make sure to keep the time approximately what it was to begin with. You purify your trusty knife. You nudge the numbers a bit more and purify a bunch of cans. This is so much more efficient than walking back into the other room to get them. You are to believe that time is at a premium, after all. It is suggested that you de-purify the pumpkin. Does this machine look like a de-purifier to you? Honestly, the idea that an purifier could both purify and de-purify things is so laughably ridiculous. You wish someone would de-purify your brain and re-purify it with a brain that is more smart and less dumb. It is suggested that you use your trusty knife to carve a spook scammer into the pumpkin. What the hell are you talking about? That idea makes no sense at all, and is basically meaningless. Try using that mushy stuff in your gourd next time. Instead, you just carve off the top, exposing a decadent cache of gorgeous seed-laden ambrosia. <coughs> uh, needless to say, you consume all of it rather quickly. But it turns out to be too gross for us to watch. Maybe you should try moving the spirograph switch. You cannot move it. It has a spirograph-shaped indentation and possibly will require a special kind of key to turn it. Then a purify the firefly out of the amber. Man, that is dangerously close. You release your blinky new friend. You will give her a name when something suitably whimsical occurs to you. Adjust the time dial to a purify the rotten pumpkin. 
You and Serenity consider new ways to waste more time with the Apira fire. What happened to the countdown? You are assuming she is a girl firefly, even though you are not really sure that fireflies can even be girls. You target the extremely tasty rotten pumpkin that was sitting in the other room hours ago. It seems the Apirifier cannot Apirify something if it will create a time paradox. A gelatinous ghost pumpkin Apirifies and quickly dissolves into a pile of unappetizing sludge. Serenity blinks a message of urgency. You nearly forgot that while trapped in the amber, she was witness to all of your tomfoolery and dilly-dallying in the other room, and knows that the timer is about to expire. It is time to get this show on the road and escape. You reset the coordinates with the right green button again, and this time only adjust the elevation by approximately 10 human measurements. How are you gonna carry that though? What? Oh right, you got rid of the bars. Too heavy. You attempt the rare and highly dangerous five times cliffhanger combo and fail. We are doing it, man. We are making this happen. What is this, like a act three intro sequence now? Oh, it blew up? Wait, it's a rocket? It's got the house on it? Shouldn't you get back in it then? Cause like, air and atmosphere and you're gonna suffocate? That's the frog place that had water around there. It's just another one. Huh. 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 What? Dear 
Sir John. You are no doubt reading this as a handsome and strapping young man. Why, the man grit needed to lift the book itself is a sign of your maturity. Not even to speak of the wisdom needed to grasp the nuance of Sassica's time-tested mischief. I am so proud of you, grandson. How I wish I could have delivered this heirloom to you in the flesh, but I am afraid it wasn't in the cards. For you see, John, like you, this book must yet take a journey. Its journey will end on the final day of my life, and even then will continue some. Though I suppose that will be up to your father. Perhaps he will discuss it with you one day, when he and you are ready. But it is your journey I am writing about, to wish you luck. There will come a day when you will be thrust into another world, and once you arrive, that is only the beginning. You will soon delve even deeper into a realm of warring royalty in a timeless expanse, a realm of agents and exiles and consorts and colonel sprites, of toiling underlings and slumbering denizens, a realm where four will gather, the air of breath, the seer of light, the knight of time, and witch of space, and together they will ascend. John, if only you knew how important you were! I regret my passing came so early in your life, and yet I feel in my heart we have already met. But what I know for sure is that we will meet again! Until then, John, I do hope your father keeps you well fed. With love, Nana. P.S. <laughs> hmm. 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 This is a head spin. This is one hell of a head spin. <laughs> it's a head spin. It's, it's, it's. It's it's something else. It's something else. It's a hundred percent something else. Woo! Okay, we had fun. Five hours of high swap, home stuck. I'm still there's still a bridge that needs to be formed to connect one to the other, but I'm sure it's it's gonna happen because it's established that intergalactic travel and uh, portals to other dimensions and all that sort of stuff is uh, is possible so <laughs> the randomness just increases um we've reacted to some part one which i haven't edited out yet so i gotta go find it start uploading it a lot uh along with hive swap lp and then i'm gonna edit this out and upload it as well um we'll, we'll do our little uh we'll play hive swap friend sim We'll do one, two, three characters, and then we'll react a little bit to Homestuck because you know I can I can make as many voices as I can, and then when it needs a break, we got to react a little bit. So we'll have nice dedicated streams, uh, and and slowly let the story unfold and hopefully piece it together. <laughs> this would definitely not be uh, not be allowed nowadays. It's uh, it's it's getting to that point in society where it's become a meme in itself. Uh, it's so ridiculous that it's become an echo chamber of, uh, of, I don't even know what to call it. It's just gone insane. So watching something like this is definitely refreshing because uh, it's got that South Park humor that used to be everywhere in the 2000s, which is, which is fun, which is fun. Um, <laughs> uh, to be fair, Frenzy works better after you read all of Homestuck. Well, uh, it, it, it's tricky. We're play we're f we're playing uh, friend sims, so we could hopefully play Hive Swapped Act Two when it comes out, or whatever they want to call it. Um, I I don't know what they're going to call it, but so we could play the next chapter when it comes out. We need to finish friend sim by then, um, and then we'll sort of chip away at Hope Stuck. To be perfectly honest, it probably is supposed to be done in a certain way, but then at the same time, it's so random at this point. That even if we don't do it in the correct order, I don't think it's going to ruin the experience because we're having so much fun with the characters that we encounter. And sure, we might know a little bit of background info, but at the same time, it is a fresh experience. So playing it completely blind isn't necessarily a bad thing because it seems to be enjoyable. So let's keep doing it this way and see how we go. 
tomorrow we are live streaming the last of us part two um we will also be doing it as part of a charity um i think uh there's a there's this charity in new zealand that provides flights to kids uh, in, rem in remote areas it's very similar to a charity that exists in australia so um we're going to be live streaming tomorrow and we're going to have a charity donation link and all the works so don't worry i will put a post around that later today i just got to make sure i make the uh overlay for that so that it all you know looks nice and everything so tomorrow is going to be the last of us part two it's going to be in the afternoon slot if in doubt hit the little schedule tab and it will show you in your local time but don't worry i will post it on twitter i will post it on discord uh and the live stream schedule tab so i hope to see you there thank you for coming i hope you enjoyed uh this was interesting to say the least and i'm gonna get cracking on editing those LPs. So till tomorrow, till next time, Ninja Kuma out. Bye.